Well, our next speaker is Dasha Hewitt. She's a new media and sound artist from Canada. Dasha is known for her examinations of communication technology in the domestic sphere. She uses DIY aesthetics and practices as artistic method to create sound installation, performances, drawings, or beautiful high-tech trash as she writes on her Instagram. Dasha is a fellow at the Berlin Center for Advanced Studies in Arts and Sciences and guest professor in New Media and Sound Art at the Karlsruhe University of Art and Design. Her art was presented at many international conferences and festivals and exhibitions, so we are very happy to welcome Dasha here today, tonight, talking about the links between socialism, lawnmowers and media art. Enjoy, this stage is yours, Dasha. Um, nice to see people in the crowd and hello to people who also might be watching online and later through YouTube or however. So mm, I am an artist and I like to do a lot of electronics. Uh, some of the things I like to look at are obsolete technology and this concept of uh, planned obsolescence. Um, aesthetics of failure, everything that's written in my slides here. Um, I wanted to start out by mentioning one of my main people of interest as an inspiration point, um, uh, Dr. Ursula Franklin. She's actually not so well known here in Germany, um, but she's a, what we call in Canada a national treasure. We have a school named after her. And she's written a lot about, uh, she comes from uh, a scientific background. She's a physicist, but she's also uh, a strong advocate, feminist, uh, pacifist. And she writes about technology in these really interesting metaphorical ways where she refers to uh, technology being a home and how people live in and throughout it, and essentially thinking of technology as a practice, and not just objects and things, but systems where people are involved. Um, myself, I'm interested in deconstructing electronics from the household, and the reason why is because it's pretty accessible. Um, I went to art school. I don't have any training in engineering or anything like this, so the best thing I can possibly do when I want to experiment with technology is go to the garbage, go to the dumpster, and pull out old gear that is uh, no longer useful to anybody else. And I can take it into my studio, and I can take it apart and see what it provides me with as far as artistic inspiration. So I never really start out with a concept, an artistic concept. I more look at a machine and I say, okay, machine, what can you tell me uh, that's interesting to work with? Mm. So I think a lot of us in the audience and here uh, at the Congress are familiar with this concept of planned obsolescence. Um, I do like to introduce it, however, because in Sometimes when I talk about it with my students, uh, I get asked if I believe in the conspiracy theory of planned obsolescence. And um, I would like to point out, as probably many of you know, that uh, this was no conspiracy theory. It's a business model uh, that started when, in the Great Depression in USA, this was one way to get out of a big economic jam, was to produce products uh, that had a limited lifespan so that people would buy things again uh, and again and again. And we really haven't stopped doing that, which is causing us uh, a lot of problems uh, because we keep having this approach. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'll show you a few sound installations, and then I'm going to show you some DIY videos um, that I worked on, and then a new project, which has to do with dissecting uh, 
uh, um, a lawnmower, and I'm very happy to be uh, sort of showing it to you guys here because it actually has its origins in this part of uh, the world. So maybe even some of the locals would have used this lawnmower back in the day. <clears throat> so. So, <clears throat> how long ago was this? I don't know, maybe close to however many years ago, maybe 2012 they started to phase out analog television signals in Canada. And instead of letting people know that uh, they can get a converter and um, plug their TV to get digital signals, a lot of people were just like, well, I guess it's just time to throw out the old TVs. Um, so I spent a lot of time going around my neighborhood and feeling kind of bad for these old televisions. Um, I'd like to point out I come from a family where my father was an antique dealer. So anything that's old and sort of left uh, on the side is, has always been something interesting to me because what I learned from my family is that looking at an object, looking at how it was used, looking at how an object was used and um, can kind of give you an insight into society or what was going on at that time in history. Kind of like if you were to look at a painting for art historical purposes, it's like a window onto a certain time. So what I noticed... Um, My cat is responding to the electrostatic discharge from the TV. Um, I'll just go back to that one, sorry. Uh, okay, okay, maybe not. What I noticed is that the old CRT telev televisions produce a lot of uh, electrostatic emissions. So when you uh, put your head in front of it, your hair sort of gets magically lifted up. And when I was doing those experiments in my studio with my hat, I really thought that I like, came upon something really unique, you know? I can make uh, static electricity make things move. Um, and then I did a bit of research, and what I found out is um, those were experiments being done like over like hundreds of years ago. I just happened to rediscover them. So what you see here is the electrostatic bell choir, and in front of the television you have these uh, bell stands, these electrostatic bell stands, which are their own little circuit in the center we have like the ground rod and on either side we have those bells and hanging suspended between each of them is a really light material um, which is called a pith ball it's actually the white material that's inside of a tree branch and so when the TV turns on or off it gets this boost of um, electri um, static electricity which makes it waver back and forth um, this installation works exceptionally well in uh, dry environments. So on my tech rider, I actually have a big dehumidifier because I have shown it before in old castles and it's completely dead at that point because the moisture kills it. So I have to run around with hair dryers and try to dry up the screens. So this is a, one of the installations. So I sort of make something that looks a bit like an altar. Um, <clears throat> It's using solid state relays to control the sequences of TVs going on and off. I have a, a pretty basic program running on an Arduino. Um, this project keeps getting more and more challenging to make as it goes along because the TVs are not as easy to find anymore and I can't get the same effect with a flat screen. So right now I have a lot of old televisions in storage and <laughs> I just hang on to them. Who knows, maybe one day the artwork will be bought <laughs> and I won't have to pay money monthly to store them. Uh, the bells themselves are actually from old rotary telephones and grandfather clocks. So, yeah. Next is a work called The Feedback Babies. And what this is, is these are baby monitors or baby phones uh, that were really abundant, let's say, in the second-hand store. This was made in 83, these were started to be made around 83, so this was a big part of my childhood. I don't know if I used one or not, but um, I noticed that they would always show up at the thrift store, so I slowly started to collect them because I thought, you know, if I get it a, 
an abundance of these things, it could probably be interesting enough to uh, make an installation with them. And I really like the quality of the feedback because it's in one way, it sounds like crying. Can you guys hear that enough or should I turn it up? No, it's good? Okay, I see some, how's that? <laughs> um, so I noticed when I move the monitor in a certain pattern in front of the, um, or when I move the uh, receiver in front of the uh, transmitter in a certain pattern, I would get nice sounds. And that one up here is what's working really well, but to figure out how to actually make that movement took me forever. <laughs> but uh, eventually the work transformed. That kind of looks a little bit, now when I'm thinking, I'm calling them feedback babies, that one looks a little bit mean. It's like hanging it. Um, <clears throat> so, Here's a close-up, a couple details of what it turned into. So in both of those two pieces, sound is a pretty important element, but I never approach sound as like a musician. I'm actually really not interested in making music. I'm more interested in hearing what the machines are giving me and then sort of placing that in a space and then seeing what it does. Um, so yeah, they're not really so composed or anything like this. Um, okay, <clears throat> so I wanted to get into some of my DIY videos. Now I'm realizing this is almost okay. 10 years old. So for this next experiment, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be um, making an audible representation of uh, AC power. So what you'll see here is we have a power cord that's uh, plugged into uh, a power bar that's going to the wall. And then we have it going to a transformer. And what the transformer is doing is it's dropping it from 120 volts AC down to 15 volts, which is a little bit more easy for us to manage for our purposes. And it's, it's directly driving the speaker. So what you're going to be hearing is this uh, 60 hertz, 60 cycle, cycle hum, which generally is something that we try to avoid. We try to cut out, you know, a lot of uh, gear for music, um, you know, has, is is made in certain ways so it gets rid of this hum, but we actually are wanting to hear precisely that and nothing else. So when I turn on this thing, the little power bar, you're gonna hear it. So here it is. So these are the kinds of things you get up to in Canada when it's really cold out. Um, so I, this was at a time where I was really first getting into working with um, this idea of open source software and everything and there is this idea like you always have to contribute back to the community. I'm like, I'm definitely not doing any fucking documentation for pure data, even though I did. It was boring. So I was like, I know I'll make these videos and this will be my contribution. So these videos that I made do go on, are, are on YouTube. Um, uh, yeah, but and I mean, now this is quite a normal thing. Uh, but 10 or close to 10 years ago, I, I don't know what I was doing. I was just putting them on there and it's nice to know that they still get seen. Um, 
This next video is um, from a collaboration I do with um, Create Digital Media, where we bring a bunch of people together, and over the course of about five days, people do all sorts of hacking related to music. There's a lot of knowledge transfer going on, and sometimes we find interesting hacks and we share them. So here we are, it's the last few hours late at night at the Hack Lab Stück um, at the Artifact Festival and a few of us are here to show you a really fun hack that we found. Uh, somebody uh, purchased a second-hand child's uh, fake microphone that gave some pretty interesting echo effects and then of course it was busted open in the spirit of the Hack Lab and then we realized that there was this really interesting uh, disco LED in there and we were playing around with it and then we thought it was like, hey man, why don't we just jack it into the mixer and see if we can hear the actual sounds of this um, little disco uh, LED. And uh, what we realized was something quite fascinating. There's actually a little chip, little integrated circuit on the inside of the LED that gives us some uh, extra special surprise. So I'm going to patch it into this jack here and then hit it Marie. Not bad. Has anyone done this before? Yeah, it's pretty fun. It's like little Alvanoto on a chip inside a LED. that we see every day, but anytime you see a little um, crappy looking um, party disco LED like this, you might want to patch it into some speakers because there's a pretty interesting sound waiting to be heard. Woo. So um, cool, drawing guys. schematics and using, I, I studied for one, one year interior design before one of the teachers like, you don't belong here, you should go to art school. Um, but I learned, I spent a whole year learning how to do technical drawing and drafting and maquette building. And this was very useful because uh, I learned how to draw lines. Uh, so there's a lot of line drawings. Uh, it's not easy. <laughs> and different sizes of lines mean, different widths of line mean different things. Um, yeah. So then on to, let's move on to this one. <laughs> Uh, what I would call probably my most technically ambitious DIY videos. Uh, what you're seeing here right now is the temple wheel of the Sideman 5000, which is um, the uh, world's oldest commercially available drum machine, which is what Wurlitzer said when it came out in 1959, although there seem to have been other things going on in different countries, but this one got a lot of hype. Um, what's special about it, too, is that it's um, working on vacuum tubes, on valves. Uh, so it's particularly scary in a certain level because it's a lot of high voltage and people have this mystical idea about vacuum tubes a lot of the time. Um, so I made a 10-part um, series. Uh, online about how each section of the drum machine works, uh, including things like the speaker, the tempo wheel, and all sorts of this. Um, sourcing the schematic wasn't the easiest thing I've ever done. It was somewhat of a hunt. Um, I did find a retired music tech uh, who was happy to email one to me and give me some give me some pointers as well. So Sideman would usually be in a box like that. And uh, they marketed it in several ways. One of them, one of the ideas was that it was a teaching machine. So, um, oh yeah, I should say it plays ballroom dance music at various different tempos, okay? 
if you speed up Foxtrot, uh, it turns into techno. Um, and then there's cha-cha and samba. Uh, it pretty much sounds like old-timey old -timey music most of the time. Uh, yeah, so I think it's most impressive, however, when the top, the, when the lid is off, because there's moving parts and beautiful wiring and this sort of thing. So I really wanted to emphasize that. Um, yeah, so I have a couple of the videos here. Maybe we watch one or two, but you can watch them all online as well. So I take a little break. gentlemen, we are gathered here today to witness the technicolor mystery that is the tone generating circuitry of Sideman 5000. One of Sideman's central goals is to convince the human ear that it is producing real life instrument sounds and this is what we call sound synthesis. Now try saying that three times fast. Sound synthesis, sound synthesis, sound synthesis. Sound synthesis is the technique of generating sounds from scratch using electronics. Now news flash people, Sideman isn't the only machine that synthesizes sound. Any of the bleep bloop sounds your computer or video games make all generate audio using this technique. And just like the guts of the tone generator, synthesizing sound can seem quite complicated. But what we have to keep in mind here is that the science behind sound synthesis is derived from how real life sounds are produced. As you know, sounds are waves of air that travel in different patterns with varying frequency and amplitude. And our human ears can make sense of a wide range of frequencies. For instance, these sounds are high in frequency. And this sound is very low in level. The brains behind sound synthesis have applied math to the physics of sound, and once we've got numbers, we can engineer electronic models that allow us to manipulate waves of electrons so that they behave the same way as real life sound waves do. Sound synthesis inside of Sideman starts right here. This is what we call Oops. our wide band noise. People, I put the wrong one on. So there was a whole section that you were going to see. We'll just skip over and look at the tone generators, all right? So, Simon is going to play some broken down tango, and we're going to take a closer look at what's going on with the tubes inside of the tone generators. Now, up in this corner here, we have an EC92. And this is a very important part of the circuit because this tube is in charge of generating all the signals required to make all of the sideman sounds. So in a way, it's sort of like genesis of sound synthesis inside Sideman 5000. Further down, we have these three tubes here. We have an ECC83, an ECC92, and an EF93. They're part of this circuit that I just mentioned here, but they're also connected to the shimmer generator. And the shimmer generator is creating cymbals, brush, and maraca. Now, if I pull out the EF93, see here? It's like pulling out one of Sideman's teeth. Yeah. And I press down on cymbals, we don't have anything anymore. Now, if I put it back in, Firmly yet carefully, symbols is back in the picture. Now, below we have a series of four ECC83s, and inside each of these um, glass envelopes, we actually have two elements, and each element is controlling one of the other sounds that Sideman makes. And on either half of the tube, we have um, something called a trimmer potentiometer, and this is something that can be adjusted to change the, uh, the filter or the tone filter, and then that allows us to sort of change the timbre of the sound that's being created. Um, what's cool about this trimmer pot is it's got a specific little spot for me to jam my screwdriver in, and I can do that here. Right now I'm affecting temple block. Let's see. I think that sounds a bit better. Come on, side man. Now, last 
lastly, up in this corner here, we have the ECC83. And this section of um, the circuit is uh, for preamplification. So all of the signals that are being generated inside this part of sideman end up over here where they get boosted once before going down over to the amplifier. So I should point out Sideman is a bit of a beast. Um, I got hurt a lot of the time along the way. Um, there's parts where there's like 300 volts coursing through and it's like, ow. Uh, or um, I thought it would be cool to do performances with it and the first one I did, I like bent over to use my mixer and I had just gotten my my hair cut and it was too short to put in a ponytail like I usually have which is not just for fashion but for function and uh, my hair got caught in the eroder <laughs> and a big clump of it came out and I sort of disappeared behind the machine for a few minutes while I tried to figure out what to do with myself uh, so I don't really do performances with that anymore <laughs> Um, anyhow, as I mentioned before, there's like an increasing number of uh, people and uh, w women too taking part in this uh, world of DIY videos and uh, one controversial figure who I kind of really love is um, uh, Naomi Wu, the real sexy cyborg. Do people follow her? Yeah, okay. so. She's from uh, uh, Shenzhen, and she makes uh, videos in her workshop. A lot of it has to do with 3D printing and coding and other things. She's pretty like into her like badass cyberpunk style. Uh, so there's a lot of um, fashion-related hacks too. And she's also a pretty strong advocate for women in um, science, uh, uh, technology, STEM, as they call it, transhumanism open source and body modifications. Uh, so also, if you can see, she's done a lot of work on her body because she's like becoming a cyborg. Um, but uh, unfortunately, there was this uh, scandal that occurred where the CEO of Make Magazine actually didn't believe that she was a real thing. Like the, the idea was like too mind blowing for him to think that there wasn't like people behind this woman doing DIY videos with a 3D printer. Um, so she called it the equivalent of getting gamergated by uh, him. But what was really interesting is she's, uh, <laughs> she's pretty persistent. Um, she was pointing people to her FAQ section, if you were ever interested in reading it, which gives a really interesting background into her aesthetic and the way that she moves about uh, her city and the big differences that might occur between what people consider sexy or what have you between uh, uh, Chinese culture and Western culture, so this was pretty interesting. And eventually, uh, she got, she did get a uh, apology from the CEO of Make, uh, which was uh, quite a thing to happen. Now, unfortunately, though, uh, Make has uh, continued to have a bit of uh, problems, even in the German uh, publications. Um, there's this uh, one publication, the Smart Home Hacks. Uh, and uh, there's in the introduction, there's a section called about wa uh, WAF. Uh, I translated it from German. And WAF refers to something called the wife acceptance factor, um, which uh, let me read here. Um, <laughs> wife acceptance factor or uh, wife approval factor is an assessment of design element that either increases or diminishes the likelihood of a wife <laughs> uh, approving the purchase of uh, expensive consumer electronic pro uh, products such as high fidelity loudspeakers. It's like okay, <laughs> that's a, I didn't I didn't know that one before, and I kind of like old things, so I was a bit surprised by this. But I was uh, more than anything a bit uh, more surprised by what this what this book was saying. So if you look at the sections that I've highlighted here and saying only a few things would make me more happy than if a woman would pick up a screwdriver after reading this book to replace her regular light switches with radio controlled ones. Like, I don't know if we need a book to tell us to pick up a screwdriver. And then uh, later on, uh, it goes on to say that uh, she will go ballistic um, if the uh, self-installed radio-controlled alarm system cannot be shut off in the most simplest ways, 
and he, on the other hand, will open the case and bypass uh, the right contacts. So anyways, I, <laughs> I think this was an attempt at a joke. However, I don't think it's very funny. And I don't think that I would go ballistic uh, in this instance. I mainly go ballistic if people are making jokes at the expense of my, my people. <laughs> Um, so this is one of the things that still occurs uh, when entering into this discussion of uh, uh, DIY, DIY culture while being a woman. Um, now what I'm going to do, what I'm, thanks. Um, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna kind of look at that Look at that concept, but through a different lens. So I'm going to switch a little bit into this next part, and um, I'm going to give you guys a little brief introduction to uh, to the history of uh, Cold War Eastern Germany, which feels funny because I'm here in Leipzig. Uh, so just <laughs> just some very brief points. Um, during this time when the wall was up uh, on this side where we are now in the east, there was really a scarcity of raw materials and industrial materials. There was an abundant uh, skilled workforce. There was uh, severe import restrictions and limited access to domestic technology and household electronics, but there was a strong culture of ingenuity and repair. Um, one of the things that I noticed myself doing, especially when I started out doing electronics, was I was always trying to find other people like me in, uh, in electronics. So if you can imagine, it's kind of exciting to find a, a, a user manual where there's a woman fixing a lawnmower. And uh, it turns out that uh, there's actually, in, in the GDR, a lot of women uh, <laughs> Um, showing um, us how lawnmowers work. Um, now, this idea of equality of women was a very strong, um, a strongly propagated goal. Like, this is something that's very present in uh, socialism. Uh, so that's uh, part of a socialist ideology, but at the same time, there was a lot of people who didn't come back from the war, so women needed to take on a more... Um, <sighs> a role that was outside of the home, uh, for instance, to uh, help rebuild, rebuild the uh, country afterwards. So, um, like, people who were once housewives were all of a sudden in brigades to rebuild. So, it was normal that there was this sort of imagery going around to encourage people to be, uh, women to be uh, taking on responsibilities that might have otherwise been just uh, seen for men. And there was, uh, yeah, so I have a collection of these uh, manuals. And I will point out a lot of people ask, how did I come across the trolley, uh, Rasenmäher? Um, and I did live in Weimar, which is pretty close by, for uh, uh, about a, a couple of years while I worked at the university there. And I lived with a, a retired television repairman. That's this guy, that's Wolfie. And, um, his home really hasn't changed since the wall came down, which is really interesting for me. And it was interesting for him to have somebody around that wanted to look at the old televisions that he would fix and this sort of thing. So I spent a lot of time learning how things work, uh, learning German at the same time. And this is what it all revolved around, was looking at this old technique. Um, I found this, I thought maybe people at the... CCC might find this interesting. He was also making plans for fixing keys and getting into locks, <laughs> like people might be here. Anyways, one of the things that I would do is uh, work in the garden. And so here we have the, the trolley, and I mean, there's something quite uh, captivating about it. I mean, I. This is this helmet looking thing. This is just the motor hood, okay? There's slots in it for there to be air circulation. But I couldn't quite help but feel like there's definitely like something menacing about that lawnmower and it looks like it's about to like do war on the grass <laughs> in the yard. Uh, I mean, I, <laughs> I don't think, 
I don't think it was like meant to be that way. I think this is pure functionality, but as an artist, I'm looking at this and it really inspires me in a certain way. So the project that I'm, look that I'm working on right now is this idea of reimagining um, a GDR uh, technology in the age of planned obsolescence. And the idea is, can deconstructing socialist era technology and connecting it to uh, present day digital culture offer alternative readings of our critical entanglement with technology? So, or uh, what kind of patterns and juxtapositions emerge when domestic electronics and commonplace attitudes, cultural practices, and techniques that surrounded technology from this historically significant socialist period inhabit uh, the realms of capitalist culture. I'm specifically interested in this idea of uh, use and reuse, and when we look at how people from uh, the GDR were and are still working with technology, this question of obsolescence becomes a bit blurry because things keep getting repaired and keep working. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, the rest of the world keeps buying new lawnmowers. Um, so I'll show you a bit of the work that I've done so far with it. Um, I worked on this introduction video with um, AGF, who's um, a musician who's also from the originally from the GDR. And the idea here is to, to look at the sort of object, the fetishized objects that we see in, in, in the tech culture now um, and sort of apply it to this uh, motor hood. What's so funny? audience that had a trolley lawnmower? Yes. And were, were you like scared of it? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah. So anyhow, um, I'm presently also working on a series of photographs with the, um, let's just call them helmets. I guess. <laughs> uh, Cause that's what they are really looking like. Um, so, I have, I, when I first came across the, the uh, lawnmower in my yard in Weimar, I was like, oh man, this thing is so special and unique. How do I get all of them? <laughs> and then I realized I don't have to worry because eBay Kleinanzagen is full of people selling parts, selling blades, selling just the motor hoods. Uh, and I'm now part of this cool club of old guys uh, that uh, trades parts. And sometimes I can have 
one motor hood if I give like a motor bed or if I have wheels or something like this. So it's really fun. It's like often it's a, you know, and then sometimes they get very skeptical. They're like, what are you doing with all these? You got seven trolleys? And I'm like, I'm an artist. They're like, I don't care. You can't have them. You can't have them if you don't need them. So yeah, I have to like down, downplay that part because it doesn't get me very far. Uh, so yeah, the, the photographs are large scale, although that kid's pretty small too. Um, um, and uh, I'm putting them in, uh, on, zuckles, uh, on, uh, on pedestals, uh, so they look like they had this history as like some warrior, uh, the warrior of the lawn. Um, and uh, yeah, actually there'll be an exhibition in April uh, at um, Halle Filzen, and this, this work will be part of it. Um, and I will close by showing you the next most inspiring lawnmower from the GDR. There's something quite lovely about uh, the ZRM450. Now, what you purchase, what you purchase is you get the chassis of your lawnmower, uh, and then you find somebody that has a a ball machine. A screw a driller, an electric drill, and then you put both of them together. Um, when I looked at these, I didn't laugh like you guys were. Uh, this like restored my faith in humanity. <laughs> I was like, this is amazing. You know, you this is really a concept that's useful for us now to think like we don't need more stuff. We just need to make friends with the neighbor who has the thing that we need to make our lawnmower work. Uh, and I like this idea of fusing two pieces of technology and getting something new out of it. So based on this uh, new uh, wonderful insight, uh, the next plan with the, with the um, trolley is to try to somehow turn it into a record player. The motor goes pretty fast on the trolley, but I think I could slow it down. And there's Lots of information out there in the high fidelity world of um, uh, record, turntable building uh, about how to build your own record player. So the idea is to really like smash some of these trolleys into making uh, a, music, a thing that can play music. So yeah, and that's uh, the end and just a small reminder for New Year's uh, to uh, make sure to turn off your computer before midnight. Thank you. Thank you, Dasha. Very inspiring talk, I'd say. Um, we now have about like 15 minutes for questions, so a lot of time. Keep them coming. The mics are open for you. Um, I also wanted to, t if there's people who have the people who have the Rasenmäher or the lawnmower at home. I would uh, like to talk with you about it, or in general, <laughs> in general, just your experience uh, from from this uh, time and now, just with tech, because this is my main big interest. Yeah. yeah thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question. I have a background in dance and the theater, and so I wonder, in the community I come from, I see you two times with Adidas. Uh, and so I wonder, what is the idea with the Adidas? Because um, As a the community where I come from, you just don't do like that, you don't. Oh, well, there's two things about that jacket. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. First of all, it's a vintage Adidas jacket. And when you move in it, you feel like, pew, pew, like you feel kind of like a superhero. And I think this is an important part of standing up in front of a bunch of people and explaining how uh, sound th synthesis works. Um, and also, uh, I teach a lot of, a lot of electronics-related courses, and sometimes it's fucking boring. And I somehow feel that if I get up there and sort of like <laughs> remind people that there's something exciting going on, they'll somehow be part of my, uh, uh, take part in the uh, discussion more. So it wasn't a new Adidas jacket, it was very old. And uh, yeah, it was to uh, make myself feel good 
and to uh, encourage people to, to, to watch me and the machine. It was a tactic like that. <laughs> Too bad I didn't bring it again. <laughs> so do we have another question? Yeah, Mike for Frone too, please. Hi. Um, just, do you think someone could fit his head inside the <laughs> thing? And, and like, how heavy is it? <laughs> um, everybody puts it on their head. <laughs> They get confused when they have like the turbo one with three slots. Now what's interesting though is that um, the material that it's made out of varies quite a lot. There's some that's very hard plastic and some that's very light. Uh, you, could, you could wear it as a, to your next uh, like fight club if you want to <laughs> scare somebody. <laughs> you could wear it, yeah. Like putting it on top of my head and maybe put another one on top of that. Just like try working out with some lights and uh -huh. turning stuff. I see where stuff. we're going here. I see where we're going. I've got quite a few if you ever wanted to test it out. I personally won't go that, that route uh, with a performative thing, but uh, yeah, I think it could, be, it could be fun if somebody else did it. <laughs> Yes, thanks for this question. I think we have a question Very from... non-fashion related questions? Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding, I like those two. <laughs> yeah, I think we have a question from the internet. Yes, first of all, um, of course everybody should invest in lawnmowers now because the prices will rise, I think, after this talk. Um, Sven G is asking, what machines uh, are you going to build in the future? Are there any upcoming projects? Um, Of course, there's always many machines that I'm thinking about. Um, the next one being the, the uh, record player. Um, but there's also, um, from learning about Sideman, I really dove into this world of uh, vacuum tubes. And there's a vacuum tube that's called a mercury uh, rectifier, or it's Quicksilver. And uh, the way it generates electronics is, or electrons is it uh, heats up mercury, and this beautiful blue cloud glows. Uh, it's really fascinating to look at, but it's also kind of creepy to think that these were in, like, heavily used in industry like up to 100 years ago, and now they're just sort of not used anymore, and they're kind of hanging out, and I want to track where these things might be, because mercury is a bit of a problem sometimes if it's not contained. <laughs> so I think I might be looking into mercury rectifiers, but I never know. Sometimes you just come across, I come across something and then it just takes my inspiration. Yeah, thanks. Um, Mike, number one, please. All right, sort of building on that, on future ideas and the lawnmower that's uh, run from a drill motor. <laughs> Do you have any ideas of these kinds of combinations that we could be doing in our lives or in, uh, in yeah. Not, not yet, but I mean, I would like to maybe uh, work with my students specifically on this topic in a, in a seminar, or do workshops where it's specifically on smashing two things together or more. Um, yeah, do you have any ideas? Well, that's why I'm curious. <laughs> no, not, not yet. Um, but I, I really like this idea of something becoming repurposed uh, and, work, and being worked through in another way. <laughs> okay, and uh, mic number four, please. Hi, thank you for the talk. It was very inspirational. Uh, I have a silly question. If you could only work on one machine for the rest of your life, what would that be? <laughs> what kind of question is that? <laughs> Well, I mean, here's the thing, like a machine can be many things, right? Like a wedge that, like it's, yeah, I don't know, a slinky? <laughs> I don't know, I'm not sure. Um, the Sideman was really fulfilling. There's so many parts to it um, that I could potentially work with that again. I mean, I also work very extensively uh, for, uh, with sound and electromechanics with the 555 timer. 
Uh, and this gets me really far as far as pushing it for uh, in many different ways. This is an integrated circuit that's you can create a clock uh, of different frequencies with, um, and it's all over the, the place. Uh, so this one, I would say, is the one that I've really gotten, uh, like I could almost build in my sleep. So yeah, that maybe it would be the 555 timer. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, we have another question from the internet. Um, CBM users asking, uh, have you ever seen a KC85, which is a computer from the German Democratic Republic? I haven't seen it yet, but I want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, not yet. Right, thanks. Uh, mic number two, please. Hi, thanks. Uh, you know I love your work. Um, I'm just wondering, because uh, there's a bit of uh, socialism missing from this uh, project, and I'm wondering if you have thought about uh, what uh, record you will use on the uh, record. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, good question. I have no idea yet. Um, I, I have no, I, I have no, I don't know. Maybe I have to build a lathe to cut a record and then go from there. I'm not sure. Uh, this is what's keeping me up at night, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> the artist. Um, number four, please. Hello, Darsha. Uh, I, I, this is the first I see of your work, and I think it is amazing. So you oh, got a new thanks. follower. Thanks. And um, also, have you done uh, these kinds of projects with like modern tech, the post-2000? Uh, no, not normally. Uh, post 2000, machine, like um, garbage, e waste. Um, okay, one thing that often gets dissected in workshops that I do is the three in one printer, because that thing's full of really useful parts. Um, but otherwise, I just like look at something that's SM, like surface mount um, components, I'm like, you are boring. I uh, so, not so much there. Or do I? Yeah, no, I'm mainly interested in things that have motors. Uh, so the the, the three-in-one scanner printer thing is is a pretty is a pretty big deal. I did a, a workshop where one of the students stripped it down and built like this, and there was ink left over, and he built like this like post-apocalyptic tattoo parlor slash machine. Uh, I wasn't, I didn't stick around for the. <laughs> For the part where it might make tattoos, but yeah. Yeah. Again, number four, please. Hi, Dasha. Um, thank you, first of all, for pointing out the uh, wife acceptance factor bullshit and uh, also showing Naomi Wu, which, whose work I also think is really great and weird and provokes, of course, a lot of uh, discourse also in the feminist movement, I guess, uh, whatever. Um, but I was wondering, as of course statistics still show that there's less female engineers and stuff like that, um, how do you consider your role mo female role model function and what is it with your students? Are there a lot of female students and what do you do especially to encourage girls? Um, I don't do much other than just show up. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, in the in the education uh, in the education bubble, um, if I'm if I'm there teaching, there's just generally uh, in the art school at least there's generally young young women young women um, and 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 men. Um, I try to make a space that really encourages uh, like failure is just as important as a success. Uh, because this is an important, like I, I, I feel like a lot of people don't necessarily re recognize that like when you're doing this kind of thing, like of course you're gonna break something. <laughs> and that's sometimes the way that you learn. Um, and yeah, just also, I think that there's this idea that we have about how electronics needs to be taught. Like you need to do Ohm's law first and you need to do this and these equations and I'm like, to me, this is not how I learned it. I learned, I walked into it backwards, you know? I was an AV technician at school and I had to learn how to use a multimeter that had like a needle. And I didn't know what the hell I was doing, so I just spent a lot of time inventing 
things and then eventually came around to figuring out how it worked. So it's more about an exploration and discovery and also knowing that uh, you can look, at, look for patterns uh, instead of thinking that you need to know a theory. And sometimes if something's not working right but it's doing something, maybe that's interesting enough and you can build artwork around that. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I think we have another question from the internet. Yes, it might be your next big project because uh, the stream is asking, would you be interested in participating in a lawnmower army workshop at the next Chaos com um, Computer Camp? I, okay, wait. Is there a prize? <laughs> <laughs> I think they, they're more talking about um, Wi-Fi access points and on lawnmowers and other things. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, 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 and of course, blinking lights. Yeah, yeah of, of course. Uh, of course I'm interested in making, uh, in making an army with these, with these guys. Why, why wouldn't I be? Yeah, <laughs> this is a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thing. Okay, so no questions anymore. Then I say thank you all for these uh, fun and interesting questions, and most importantly, thank you, Dasha, again for this great talk. And thank you. such a pleasure to have you here. Let's give her a last round of applause. Yeah.